the, the question is, um, where did the objects from the Bagram collection come from? I'm, I'm, I'm going to give you a little backstory to this because I, I didn't actually have a chance to tell you about the four collections that we had. You know, having the honor of trying to condense Afghan culture down to you know, 228 objects is a real challenge. We have four collections. The first collection is a Bronze Age collection, 4,000 years old, made of native gold from Afghanistan. There are three bowls down there. The second collection is a reflection of what happens when you have a lot of native wealth and that is that it attracts invaders. And so we decided that we would pick a collection from I think the greatest invader who ever work, walked on the earth and that's Alexander the Great. And he founded eight cities in Afghanistan. We've got artifacts from one of them down there, the Ikhanum collection. The question is about where did the Begram collection come from? We needed another collection that highlighted Afghanistan's special role in world history, Begram is a merchant's warehouse from 2,000 years ago. Most exceptional situation in archaeology. The merchant, knowing that he had very, very valuable goods, bricked it up, thinking that you know, he would come back. And thanks, you know, thank goodness for archaeology, he never came back. And the archaeologists excavated this intact merchant's warehouse at the very center of the Silk Road. So what's in the warehouse? What about these bronzes? The bronzes are all imported. They are all made in the Mediterranean world, maybe in Egypt, maybe in Rome, maybe in Syria. The glass is all imported. Some of it's been scientifically analyzed and that beautiful enameled glass, three goblets, we know those come from Alexandria, Egypt. These are being imported from thousands of miles away. They're being traded through. Some of them are going to be traded to royalty or or wealthy patrons in Afghanistan, some of them are going to be traded on further. There were also ivories there that came from India. Uh, it's just an amazing array. It complements the final collection, which is the, the Bactrian gold, which is all local. So the Bagram collections are all imported objects. Another question, please. Yes. It's a, a great set of questions. The first question is, um, how is it that these sumptuous golden burials were never robbed? It, it's, it's a great question. And um, uh, maybe I'll start out with a quick anecdote from Victor Sarinidi, who when he was excavating these burials, you know, he had armed guards and he, he had a lot of visitors who came and, you know, they were, everybody was very interested. And uh, one day a local farmer came up, he was ripping out his hair, he was crying. He was saying, oh, my wife is beating me. Victor said, why? He said, I've lived here all my life. I never found any gold. <laughs> the, the site is actually named Tilatepe, which in the local language means a golden hill. <laughs> so one wonders why it was never found. Actually, you know, the site is a big mound. It's like archaeological sites around the world. It's actually a site where people lived, where they built buildings, and these buildings made out of mud brick, unbaked mud brick, would collapse after time, and people would knock them down or they would build on top of them, and slowly your settlement gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger until it's a mound. Um, and 2,000 years ago, this mound already existed as an archaeological site. It was already ancient remains. And I think, this is my hunch, that 2,000 years ago, during some winter, some terribly cold time or famine, that this family, one man and five women, perished due to you know, unfortunate circumstances. Their families were nearby, and they buried them with great care in the archaeological site. They used it as a mound, right? So they hid the burials in amongst these old walls. And because of that, nobody actually knew that it was a burial site. 
Nobody knew that these burials were there. And I think, you know, in, in general, people are kind of wary of sort of snooping around old archaeological sites. You know, maybe there are ghosts there, there are old buildings, you know, dogs, things like that. Um, and so, believe it or not, for 2,000 years, these golden burials stayed there until Victor came. He actually found them by accident. He found them because he was looking for the buildings underneath. So, that's how these they stayed there, and if Victor hadn't found them, they'd probably still be there. And your second question was? Yeah. Ah, the, the analysis of the gold. Yes. Well, you know, um, we are just beginning to analyze the artifacts in these collections. As I mentioned, when Victor found these collections in 1978-79, he didn't have a chance to study them, so they were put in boxes right away. We're just beginning to do the scientific analysis right now. So we've just completed our first set of scientific analysis. The gold is very pure, and there are local sources for gold, and the quantity of gold is so immense. Uh, and the gold is so consistent that we believe that it comes from the Oxus River in northern Afghanistan. But more to the point, the, the stone, the turquoise, comes from very close by. There is a turquoise mine at um, a site called Nishapur in actually Iran, not very far from northern Afghanistan where these were found. And I had the honor of visiting there and we compared the turquoise and it's exactly from that area. So we do believe these are locally made. Next question. Oh, go, Deb, you, you pick. Thank you. Uh, with uh, nearly 7,000 military, uh, international military in Afghanistan right now, uh, and with the Karzai government now having um, discussions with the Taliban about political solutions to the issues going on there, uh, have you heard whether there's something in their discussions that would uh, protect so the question is, what about the preservation and the continuing preservation of archaeological sites and the museum as well um, in Afghanistan? Those are uh, uh, both incredibly important things. And I'm really pleased to say that cultural heritage preservation is a priority in Afghanistan not only of the Karzai government, but of the NATO forces that are there. We do training courses for the soldiers who go over to Afghanistan to sensitize them about cultural heritage in Afghanistan so that they don't accidentally destroy an archeological site. We work with the Afghans, um, the US State Department, the Park Service, National Geographic, universities around the US are working on what I believe is the most important thing that we can do for cultural heritage in Afghanistan, and that is training of people. You can imagine 25 years of war meant that 25 years, a whole generation of people don't know about their own heritage and don't have training in taking care of these sites, and we're very pleased here in San Francisco right now, we've got three Afghans who are working with the Park Service in learning about site management. This is fantastic. Um, and so we are working with, with all the people possible to try and preserve their heritage so that they feel proud. So the Afghans everywhere from north and south in Afghanistan feel proud of their cultural heritage. 